Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, whichever session it is of Open Readings. Sorry, I don't remember the number. But it's an honor to present our guest lecturer for this session, uh, Professor Richard Hoover from the NASA um, Ast Astrobiology Division, uh, who will talk to us about microfossils and biomolecules and meteorites. Thank you very much. Uh, it's indeed an honor to be here to speak with you this afternoon, and I have very much enjoyed having an opportunity to see some of this beautiful city. It's my very first visit to Lithuania. Microfossils and biomolecules in meteorites. The fundamental question of astrobiology has been, is life restricted to the planet Earth or widely distributed throughout the cosmos? Meteorites are, in fact, messengers from space. They bring to Earth materials from the protosolar nebula and materials that they have gathered during their long transit through the cosmos from the time that they were first formed until the time they arrived on Earth. Discoveries of biomolecules and indigenous microfossils and carbonaceous meteorites may provide a definitive answer to this very important question. Scanning electron microscopy studies carried out since 1997 in the United States uh, by myself and my colleagues at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center and in Russia by academician Alexei Rosanov at the Paleontological Institute of the Russian Academy of Sciences have produced recognizable images of fossil microorganisms in a wide variety of carbonaceous meteorites. Energy dispersive X-ray studies have shown that these fossils are typically carbon rich and nitrogen deficient and permineralized or infilled with water soluble salts. The content of nitrogen uh, below the level of detection of the energy dispersive X-ray spectrometer, which would be less than about 0.5%, indicates that these well-preserved remains are ancient and perished long before the meteorites entered the Earth's atmosphere, which of course would imply that they are indigenous and extraterrestrial rather than modern terrestrial contaminants. In history, the study of microfossils in meteorites really began in 1991 when Bartholomew Nagy and George Klaus discovered complex organics. They were studying oil shales and they, uh, Bartholomew Nagy had a gas chromatograph which allowed him to look at uh, organic chemicals within the oil shales and he decided to look for organic chemicals within carbonaceous meteorites and he found that they were essentially identical to the kind of things he was familiar with in oil shales. He then contacted a microbiologist, George Klaus, and they started looking at prepared uh, specimens of the Orgai meteorite and found a variety of structures that they considered to be biological and published a very important paper in 1961 in Nature. It, uh, it was with the conclusion that these were indigenous and extraterrestrial and microbiological, and it of course created a firestorm of criticism and controversy. Uh, and in 1962, there was a major meeting in New York in which, uh, which was moderated by Nobel laureate Harold Urey. And during that meeting, he stated if these were actually present in, uh, in modern uh, in terrestrial samples, we would have no doubt but what they were biological. But since they were in meteorites, and everyone knew that meteorites had uh, igneous rock materials in them, and it would be impossible for there to be microfossils or microorganisms associated with volcanic materials, they concluded that they probably couldn't be biological. Well, of course, at that time, they didn't know about deep sea hydrothermal vents either. In 1996, David McKay reported the discovery of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, magnetites, and nanofossils in the Mars meteorite ALH84001. Uh, those, that's the, whoops, I went backwards. This is the famous Mars worm. Uh, and the problem is that these structures, that's a 500 nanometer bar, these structures are extremely small. And they're really not definitively biological. You can't look at this and say, Yea, verily, I know that that's a microorganism, or I know that these are microorganisms. Uh, over here, these are some of the structures that Klaus and Nagy uh, found, and they were generally uh, dismissed as being pollen grains. How come I'm not getting an advance? Hmm. 
keys, move the mouse. Oh. It's now working. Now working? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, excellent. Uh, by way of basic definitions, meteorites are debris from asteroids, comets, moons, or planets that survive the transit through our atmosphere. Carbonaceous chondrites or carbonaceous meteorites contain extraterrestrial carbon, water, organic chemicals, biomolecules, and microfossils. Biomolecules are essentially molecules that are produced by life. They are essential to living organisms as opposed to organic chemicals. There are a wide variety of organic chemicals that can be produced abiotically. Uh, one of the important points of, of biomolecules is you have homochiral amino acids, sugars, nucleic acids, DNA, RNA, and structures like that that uh, are not uh, formed by abiotic processes. Microfossils are fossils of ancient microorganisms, and they are microscopic in size, and there are a wide variety of different types of eukaryotic and, and uh, prokaryotic cells that are studied as microfossils. In the prokarya, we have uh, archaea, bacteria, and cyanobacteria are the dominant kinds that are encountered in, uh, in carbonaceous meteorites. You also see bacterial mats, but a mat is identifiable, whereas individual cocoidal or, or uh, bacillus-type bacteria are very difficult to tell much about by morphology alone. And typically, all bacteriologists today do taxonomy on the basis of 16 sRNA. One of the interesting points is there I've had people tell me you can't tell anything by morphology alone, and when they tell me that, I say, well, the problem is for the last two centuries, scientists have identified genera and species of diatoms, cyanobacteria, radiolaria, silicoflagellates, et cetera, on the basis of morphology alone. And if you contend that morphology is not good for anything, then you have to say, well, probably paleontology shouldn't be considered a science, but when you find a Tyrannosaurus rex, it isn't very difficult to convince other people that that was probably a biological organism at one time in the distant past. The eukaryotes that we find include acrotarchs, algae, prosenophyte algae, diatoms, forams, fungi, and testate amoebae. And the taxonomy of many of these ancient groups are classified entirely by cell morphology, size, and range. Biomolecules are present in all living organisms. So one of the dominant types that we find in carbonaceous meteorites are the amino acids, uh, which are relatively simple kinds of molecules. We have the carboxyl group and the amino group and the R side chain and the hydrogen. And in glycine, that R side chain is hydrogen. So glycine is symmetric. All of the other amino acids, that R side chain is something different. So they are asymmetric. And as a result of that, you have chirality. They are formed like L-alanine here and the D variant. And the L variant is called L-alanine because it's lever rotary. It rotates the plane of visible light in a counterclockwise direction as opposed to rotating the plane of visible light in a clockwise direction in the D enantiomer. When you make these amino acids by abiotic processes, you get amino, uh, racemic mixtures. You get equal numbers of L and D uh, amino acids, and so D over L equal 1. Well, it's interesting that even though there are thousands of amino acids, there are only 20, well, really 23, but we only count 20 as the major ones, proteinogenic amino acids. They are encoded by the genetic code in the L enantiomer, and they are the form, or they form proteins of all living organisms. And this phenomena of homochirality uh, is, is in fact uh, a very, profound and important characteristic. In uh, biomolecules that we uh, also are important in this study are nucleobases like the purines adenine, guanine, and the pyrimidine cytosine, thymine, and uracil, which are essential for the canonical base pairing of DNA and RNA. And of course, you have the D-sugars, ribose, and deoxyribose. In DNA and RNA, all of the sugars are all the D in antiomer. You have carbohydrates, lipids, and in the meteorites we find ancient biomolecules like humic and fulvic acids, prestain, phytane, and vanadium porphyrins, which are the breakdown products of chlorophyll. Most of the carbon in carbonaceous meteorites is kerogen. The vast majority is kerogen. You have others that are in the aromatics, uh, in the amino acids, and so forth. But the kerogen is these huge uh, molecules that occur with the breakdown of biological materials on Earth. And uh, you have them in oil shales and, of course, the, the dominant form in coal. <coughs> 
At the age of 25, a very brilliant young man by the name of Louis Pasteur discovered chirality in biomolecules. He was studying the optical activity of crystals uh, from wine dregs, and he found out that the paratartaric acid uh, rotated the plane of polarization of visible light. But yet, when he made paratartaric acid by chemical processes, it didn't, and he was curious. So he took the crystals and meticulously separated the one shape of the crystal that was like this from the other shape like this. And when he got them separated, he discovered that they each had optical activity and one rotated the plane of polarization right-handed and the other left-handed. But when he was looking at the, uh, the paratartaric acid from the wine, it had all been made by biological processes. So all of, the, uh, all of these crystals were of the same uh, enantiomer. A basic requirement of life is that all living organisms require a coexistence of water, a source of energy, and some biogenic elements. There are about 20 major biogenic elements that are life critical. The, the most important of those are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. There are these minor biogenic elements that we have here and trace elements. Uh, but essentially, that's the major part of the periodic table that's involved in life. The rest of them just rarely play any role whatsoever. Carbon and nitrogen and the fixation of those, uh, those types of elements is absolutely essential for life. Carbon in the form of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is not usable uh, directly in the formation of the biomolecules. And nitrogen has this strong triple bond that is very, very difficult to break. But biological organisms utilize enzymes, nitrogenase enzymes, and they break this triple bond so that they make nitrates and amines and, and amino acids and so forth that are then capable of being used readily by living organisms. One of the most important things to note is that water is a unique and precious and profoundly important molecule. It is essential for all life that we know. It's the second most abundant uh, compound, I should say, in the universe. It composes 60 to 70 percent of the mass of all living cells. And the fascinating thing is that the water molecule uh, has this kind of a, an H2O with a HOH bond angle of 104.5 degrees, which gives water molecules polarity. Uh, water expands on freezing. It has high surface tension, high boiling point. And the most interesting thing, the maximum density is at plus 3.4 degrees Celsius for fresh water and at minus 3 Celsius for salt water. And as you know very well, if you put liquids of different densities together, the most dense liquid sinks to the bottom and the least dense liquid stays to the top, which leads to a very important conclusion. The deep oceans and seas throughout the universe are all the same. The oceans under the crust of Enceladus, if it's fresh water, it would have a temperature near the bottom of plus 3.4 C. If it's salt water, about minus 3. So if you take microorganisms from the bottom of the Atlantic or the bottom of the Pacific and transferred them to Enceladus or Europa or Pluto and throw through the crust into the oceans beneath, they should be perfectly at home. One of the things that I love to study are what we call microbial extremophiles, and they grow from temperature range of about minus 20 C to over 150 C. Uh, well, actually, I say here 120. We have an organism we've been working with for two decades that actually lives and grows at 150 C, but I didn't put that here because we've never published it because we have no clue what it is. We haven't been able to get a 16S gene sequence. Uh, it's a great treasure of my laboratory, and one of these days I hope we'll be able to publish it. Microbial extremophiles inhabit polar ice caps, glaciers, ice caves, hypersaline pools, this incredible array of regimes, uh, uh, deep sea hydrothermal vents, uh, and deep within the crust of the Earth. Uh, tens of kilometers down, you have chemolithotrophs that live in the rocks break up the rocks and extract from them the necessary chemical elements to form water and carbon compounds. And they live entirely by uh, chemolithotrophic processes, in which case, essentially, they're eating rocks and making the necessary materials for life. 
Microorganisms can also grow certain types on spent nuclear fuel rods. Uh, and uh, I went fast, sorry. Uh, spent nuclear fuel rods, and uh, uh, they have the capability of remaining uh, uh, resistant to high levels of radioactivity. Uh, I've had an opportunity to s search for microbial extremophiles in a wide variety of places. These are some of the cold places in, in the Matanuska Glacier, the ice cave of the Schirmacher Oasis in Antarctica, uh, the ice cave in the Kvarkuvat ice cave of Kvatnakul ice cap of Iceland, and I also collected samples to search for microorganisms uh, at the South Pole with uh, Jim Lovell and Owen Garriott. These are a beautiful little organism, Spirochaeta americana, that I collected in uh, hollow alkaline uh, lake, uh, mono lake in California. Uh, they're obligate anaerobes. Uh, they uh, require absence of oxygen in order to live and grow. And uh, we named this uh, new organism uh, Spirochaeta americana uh, when it was published in 2003. Professor Sabita Buizov uh, of the Russian Academy of Sciences uh, spent two seasons uh, wintering over at Vostok, Antarctica and drilling in the deep Vostok ice. And many years ago he brought me samples of deep Vostok ice and we started looking at it under the electron microscope. And we found very interesting things. This is a pair of diatoms that had just replicated. They're from the 2,827 meter core beneath the, uh, the surface of Lake Vostok. Uh, we searched for microbial extremophiles in a core that I took from uh, a uh, Pleistocene thermokarst pond in, uh, in Alaska, and uh, the Fox Tunnel of Alaska, and we found very interesting uh, organism that we were able to culture and grow. 32,000 years old, the first living organism on Earth from the Pleistocene that's alive today, and we named that organism Carnobacterium Pleistocinium. Uh, it's a psychrotolerant rather than a psychrophilic, which means that it can, it can live in cold temperatures, but it can also live at room temperature. It's perfectly happy growing in a wide variety of, uh, of conditions. Uh, it is anaerobic. In 2008, uh, I drilled through the, through the ice. We, uh, we had to ultimately drill through 10 meters of ice to get to the water of Lake Untersee. And uh, I brought back samples from many different uh, levels in the lake. Spent three days on my hands and knees on the ice putting down camera bottles to return samples of pure uh, liquid from the lake from each different depth. And then last year, in September of 2018, we published a paper describing a new species, new genus, and new family of bacteria that we named William Whitmonacea uh, terracasi. This little guy looks like dandelions, big slender stalks, and puffball heads on it. Uh, uh, for years, we were calling it our dandelion organism. And uh, they wouldn't allow us to name it William Whitmonaceae dandelioni, so we called it terracasi, which is the Latin name for dandelion. We decided, you know, if you sneak things in. <laughs> This organism is very interesting because it has many unusual properties. It has reverse transcriptase genes, which were discovered initially in the HIV virus. Uh, it also has a new kind of organelle that in this paper we described, and we call these organelles anti-I. And here are anti-I shown on uh, William Whitmonaceae, these little filamentous things. You can barely see them. They're almost invisible. Uh, and that's probably the reason that they were never described before, because when scientists saw them, they thought it was just trash. <clears throat> but when we saw them and did videos, we saw that they were actually the organelles responsible for the gliding motility of this organism. And then we found, by looking at the entire genome of, uh, of William Whitman ACI, which we have obtained and have deposited in the gene bank, that the uh, genes for gliding motility are present in this uh, organism. And astonishingly, the genes for gliding motility are also present in the Ebola virus. And we found anti-I in Ebola. We found anti-I in the Henrietta Lack strain of the, the HeLa cells. Uh, we found anti-I in Spirochaeta americana. So, and we also found the genes for gliding motility in these diverse groups of life. Uh, so I think that anti-I are 
very much more abundant than had previously. Well, in fact, it was not that they weren't abundant then. They, nobody knew they even existed. Uh, I want to now go to a very interesting point about comets. Everyone has thought for a long, long time that comets were extremely cold, no possibility of liquid water in comets. I want you to look at this image uh, there and you see that giant brightening. That's Comet 9P Temple 1 when it was out beyond the orbit of Mars and the deep impact spacecraft was preparing to impact on it, but that wasn't when the impact occurred. That was when a large chunk of ice blew away from the surface because the, the temperature, this is out beyond the orbit of Mars, 330 Kelvin. That's uh, about 57 Celsius. That's on the front of the comet exposed to sunlight. And all this back here is 280. Uh, actually, this should go down lower than that, but I don't think they wanted to include 273 because that's the water ice uh, interface uh, uh, temperature where ice melts. Comets also contain uh, amino acids. The uh, amino acid glycine was found uh, in return samples from uh, uh, Comet uh, VIL-2 by our Stardust mission. Uh, uh, Northite and Cubanite were also present as minerals, and those are only found and only formed in liquid water. So that gives a definitive line of evidence for the existence of liquid water on comets. We also see these beautiful pictures of 67P Cherimov Gerasimenka. We see these nice streamers where gases, as it co comes near the sun and it gets hot, the volatiles are being blown off and they're bringing out particles of ice and, and water that rapidly freezes and uh, dust and so forth. And that's what gives rise to these, uh, these beautiful streamers. And the solar wind eventually forces these into an anti-solar direction and you wind up with a tail. Um, here is a color photograph of 67P, the only one that was ever published. And if you look at it carefully, there are dark blue-green areas, green patches, and so forth, uh, and red and, and purple uh, regions on it as well. Those could well be produced by cyanobacteria. You have a wide variety of cyanobacteria that form these different colors. Uh, uh, when we did diving at Lake Undersea, we discovered large stromatolites under the 10 meters of ice that were growing at very, very low light levels, and they were deep red and purple in color but they were cyanobacteria. They would have been blue-green in color if they had been growing in the pond uh, at the uh, uh, end of the road. <clears throat> Carbonaceous meteorites have an elemental composition very similar to the solar photosphere. Uh, they have 3 to 22 percent deuterium enriched water, about 4 percent extraterrestrial carbon, and they contain uh, diamonds and silicon carbide grains and zircons and so forth that are 4.6 billion years old, so they're older than the planet Earth. They're older than the solar system. They have come into the uh, protosolar nebula being ejected from supernovae and then got incorporated into the meteorites. Uh, that does not mean that everything on the carbonaceous meteorites is that old. I, I've had people say, are you saying that these fossils are 4.6 billion years old? I said, no, of course not. I'm less than four and a half billion years old myself, and yet I live here on Earth. So, not much less. Carbon in the meteorite rock matrix is mainly kerogen, as I mentioned before. And the fascinating thing is that studies of the uh, of biomolecules Duracell, the Del 13C, uh, this was work done by Martins et al. They got a value of plus 44.5 per mil, and xanthine plus 37.7 per mil. You would never find those kinds of, of isotope uh, uh, compositions in any terrestrial carbon. So that proves that uracil and xanthine in the meteorites are extraterrestrial in origin and nature. There's extensive aqueous alteration of the minerals that are found, and that proves that there was liquid water on the parent body, and the deuterium-hydrogen ratio of the carbonaceous water in the carbonaceous meteorites is very similar to that of comets. Uh, in 1988, Sargent uh, did an intensive study and concluded that the Murchison meteorite that landed in 1969 is probably associated with the comet Finley. 
there are a variety of biomolecules found in carbonaceous meteorites. Uh, you have amino acids, carboxylic acids, hydroxy acids, sugar-related compounds, but not sugars, amines, amides. Uh, as I said before, nitrogen heterocycles like some of the purines and pyrimidines, sulfur heterocycles, aromatic hydrocarbons, aliphatic, uh, aliphatic hydrocarbons, and terpenes. So there's a whole host of these complex uh, organics, uh, but the ones that are absent are very interesting because uh, cytosine degrades into uracil with a half-life of 17,000 years, and thymine degrades into xanthine at uh, uh, 0 C and pH of 7 with a half-life of 1.3 million years. So you could have had all of the necessary nucleobases in living organisms in, in a, uh, uh, the, whatever was the uh, uh, parent body of the carbonaceous meteorites, as long as that life died long, long ago. It had to have been many half-lives of 1.3 million years, or you should expect to find thymine uh, in, the, in the meteorite. But they're not uh, found, have never been detected by all of the scientists that have studied the biomolecules and organics of the carbonaceous meteorites. Well, in 1806, March the 15th, the Alay meteorite uh, landed in uh, southern France, and it was the first uh, carbonaceous chondrite known. Berzelius studied it in 1834 and found water. He almost threw his sample away. He said, it's contaminated. It can't be real. Uh, then he found other scientists that found water, and so he went back and studied it, and he made a number of interesting discoveries, including finding uh, evidence of organics. Um, in uh, uh, in 1864, Pisani and Klotz uh, found carbon and water and organics similar to coal, and they also reported that Orgay disintegrated upon, ah, in my movie, I guess there isn't working, is it? Well, okay, it's turned into sound. <laughs> I had a video showing a piece of Orgay disintegrating when a droplet of water is dropped on it, and uh, uh, that's not showing well, but uh, uh, it, it actually happens very, very quickly. When you drop a drop of water on the Orgay meteorite, it's like you've dropped a drop of water on an Alka-Seltzer tablet. It starts bubbling and, and disintegrates into particulates very quickly because the Orgay meteorite is essentially what we call a microregolith breccia. It's a bunch of tiny particles held together by uh, mainly magnesium sulfate salts, and when you put water on it, these magnesium sulfate and ammonium sulfate and other water-soluble uh, salts uh, dissolve, and the meteorite starts disintegrating. Nagy reported organized elements in 62, and in 1963, Palik, uh, who was a, an algologist, at uh, Eotvos Loran University, drew these pictures of what she called blue-green algae in the Orgay meteorite. Well, I find exactly the same kind of things. Uh, here you see a filament coming up with an apical cell, and she marked delineation of, of cells here. Here is a tapered filament ending in an apical cell, uh, as you would expect in a tapered calyptrate trichome of uh, Nosticacean cyanobacteria, and this is in the Murchison meteorite. Uh, one of the fascinating things, though, is that at that point in time, uh, Klaus and Nagy could not definitively say that what they had was indigenous to the meteorite because there were too many people saying it was probably pollen grains, and uh, so they called them organized elements. And then the problem with Pollock's work is even though she could recognize it as biological and cyanobacteria, it was dismissed as being essentially contamination. Uh, and she had no way of proving that it was not the biological contaminant. The palynologist, uh, the father of palynology, really, uh, Timofeyev in St. Petersburg, Russia, found a whole host of, of uh, acrotarchs that he described uh, from the uh, uh, Migay CM2 carbonaceous chondrite. And uh, th this was really the first absolutely definitive evidence, in my opinion, because acrotarchs are extinct. Uh, you would not expect extinct uh, eukaryotic organisms to be present uh, as a modern contaminant. In 1997, academician Rosanoff and I, working independently, both reported the detection of, of cyanobacteria and acrotarchs in the Orgay and the Murchison carbonaceous meteorites. 
Well, in terms of, of uh, materials and methods uh, for the research I'm going to tell you about, I obtained samples of Orgay meteorite from Claude Perron of Musée d'Histoire Naturelle de Paris, from Emile Ladier, from Montauban Museum, uh, Paul Sapiro at Planetary Studies Foundation, and the Field Museum of Chicago, and Bill Birch at the Murchison, uh, 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 Murchison samples from the Victoria Museum in Melbourne, Melbourne, Australia, where most of the Murchison materials are, are maintained. In terms of methods, uh, I didn't want to be accused of, of getting uh, coding artifacts, which is what David McKay was accused of. And we had a new microscope at the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center that allowed you to do scanning electron microscopy studies of uncoded non-conductive samples. So we used this environmental scanning electron microscope calibrated, we're using element and mineral standards and uh, uh, lunar grains and so forth. Uh, we essentially, I would break the sample and uh, put it in uh, uh, using sterilized tools, uh, sterilized with propane torch, which is not only killing bacteria, but vaporizing bacteria. <laughs> so that way I knew it couldn't have any bacteria contaminants. Uh, and I basically did studies only of uncoated, freshly fractured interior surfaces, flame sterilizing all the tools, and null controls, uh, as I said, from silicon wafers. One of the important things is that you can recognize modern contamination by the effect of the beam and the energy dispersive spectroscopy data on nitrogen levels. Uh, these are the various meteorites th that I've studied at uh, Marshall Space Flight Center. The yellow ones, uh, or the green ones, is where the microfossils are, I would consider to be abundant. You don't have to look very long before you find them. The yellow ones, they're present, but it may take several hours, or perhaps even a day or two before you start finding microfossils in these meteorites. And in the red, I, all of the time that I've spent looking, I have never found microfossils in Karunda or Allende uh, meteorite and never found them in any of these uh, L4, uh, L6 uh, uh, chondrites or the diogenite Tatooine or these nickel iron meteorites that we collected in the Tuyal Mountains of Antarctica. Uh, so basically, uh, the most abundant uh, microfossils are found in the uh, CI and uh, uh, CI1 and C2 ungrouped uh, carbonaceous meteorites, and in some of the uh, some of the CM2 carbonaceous meteorites. In addition to the biomolecules I mentioned before, other scientists have found that they detect uh, pristane and phytane, which are long chain hydrocarbons, isoprenoid hydrocarbons, and they're derived from the phytol chain of the chlorophyll molecule. Now, interestingly, they never found chlorines or chlorophyll itself. If these were contaminated by modern cyanobacteria, you shouldn't find ancient porphyrins and ancient pristine and, and phytane breakdown products. You ought to find chlorines and chlorophyll and, and uh, so forth. So that's another mechanism where one can say it's another line of evidence that these are indigenous. There is no known abiotic production mechanism for the chlorophyll molecule. If there was, if you knew one, you could probably make a fortune. There are only eight known groups of carbonaceous chondrites. They're considered the most primitive meteorites that we have. Uh, and in these meteorites, we find astonishingly well-preserved microfossils. Here is not microfossil. This is living Lingbia wollii growing in my laboratory that I collected in Lake Gunnersville, not far from my home. And I wanted to show you this because that little dimple there is where the 15 kilovolt beam from the scanning electron microscope hit this emergent hormogonium. That's a reproductive structure of this cyanobacteria. And when you strike it with the beam long enough to get energy dispersive X-ray spectral data, you can clearly see that you've damaged that little guy. We don't usually see da beam damage in true microfossils. Now, the other important point is the measured nitrogen, as you see here in this little nitrogen peak, was uh, 6.87 weight percent, or about 6.51 uh, atomic percent. And that's typical. Modern cells contain anywhere from 2 to 20 percent uh, nitrogen. I've never seen less than 2, uh, and I've not seen a, more than 20. 
But the important question is how long do they retain that nitrogen? So I studied a lot of things to try to get an answer to that question. This is the hair that I collected in Siberia from a woolly mammoth. Uh, I know that mammoth to be 32,000 years old. And there's the beam damage where the beam came in on this modern mammoth hair, only 32,000 years. And notice here, there's a very, very beautiful nitrogen peak because, of course, that hair contains lots of protein that hasn't disintegrated. And uh, so we get a nitrogen of 11.6% uh, atomic. And that guy is clearly not a modern biological material. By doing this kind of study with all of the samples that I find, everything that I find in a meteorite that looks biological, I do energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy. And here are filaments in the Orgay meteorite, in the Murchison meteorite. Up there, there are a couple of filaments of fungi in Murchison that we discovered were showing nice nitrogen peaks. And I thought, what's going on? I told my friend we should take it out of the microscope. And we went and looked, and we saw a pale blue-green color. They were moving around under the beam. That was a piece of Murchison that had been lying in a museum shelf in Chicago. And when Dr. Manakshi Vadva sent it to me, I called her. I said, hey, are you sure this isn't contaminated? Well, she said, uh, why do you ask? I said, well, we're finding fungi on the outside of it. I said, how did you protect it from being contaminated? Well, she said, we don't do that. Why, why would we worry about such things? They kept it in a museum drawer and open to the air. And what had happened was I had gone off on my microscope and fallen into an old crack in the fusion crust. And so I was looking at um, recent material that had invaded this old crack. Now here, we have 2.7 billion year old cyanobacteria and trilobites, and they're all the same as what we see in almost all of the filaments in the Orgay meteorite. There's actually one, that's an aconite that got up to above 2%, but I'm convinced that that is indigenous and it had uh, continued to retain nitrogen on the inside of this uh, uh, thick uh, uh, a cell wall of the uh, heterosister aconite. This is an interesting uh, bit of data because uh, here we see nitrogen and, and uh, we see the, uh, uh, the amino acids in the various living bacteria. These are the, uh, the typical amino acids that you associate with proteins. Uh, and here's alpha amino isobutyric acid. These are non-biological, non-protein amino acids. But the important point to note here, these are the amino acids found, oops, I went the wrong way. These are the amino acids found in the Murchison, Murray, Orgay, and Ivuna meteorite. These are the amino acids found in hadrosaur bones and the amino acids found in flies in amber. And you notice these lines that says, oh, it's not there. So the same amino acids that are missing from the meteorites are also missing from hadrosaur bones and amber encased flies, which tells me that the absence of those amino acids doesn't mean that what we're looking at is all biological. It simply means that it's very old. This is an interesting pair of images. I showed this earlier. This is, this is a formidium. Uh, and you see it comes up to a circular apical cell, looks very much like a tasty donut. And here we call this organism, this formidium, when it's found in ancient sites, uh, uh, we call it Siphonophicus. This is in the Coupsagul uh, Cambrian phosphorites. And here are all of these donuts lying around that were from the apical cell. It's not looking like a nice one there because somebody came along and took a bite out of it, I think. <laughs> Tasty. <laughs> this is a lovely image of this same uh, uh, complex uh, array of cyanobacterial filaments with a glycocalyx here. And here we see this exact object in visible light. And it is jet black in color which is because of the fact that this has undergone the transformation of, of all of the organic material being converted into, into keratin. Here we have 2D X-ray spectroscopy of it, and we see the carbon. Uh, there's nothing there in oxygen except in the phyllosilicate cap, and uh, uh, it's negative in iron, and about the same throughout in nickel and sulfur. If this were a late contaminant, you would expect the nickel and sulfur maps to be like the uh, like the iron map. Uh, this is a, uh, an embedded filament uh, uh, of Nosticacean cyanobacteria in, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, Murchison carbonaceous meteorite. 
uh, Academician Galimov did this study of the uh, relative distribution of, uh, of these amino acids uh, using its parameters of beta sigma 13C versus del 13C. And in all the living things, the del 13C went from about minus 4 per mil to about minus 24. But here he finds the same relationship of the amino acids in the Murchison meteorite going from uh, uh, plus 50 per mil, or plus 20 to plus 50 per mil. That is clear proof that those amino acids are extraterrestrial, but academician Galimov said in his book on the uh, biological fractionation of stable isotopes that the, there was a dramatic analogy between the relative distribution of amino acids in Murchison and the relative distribution in living things. When I saw that and met him first, I told him that to me that was the best evidence, bio uh, biochemical evidence and uh, isotopic evidence for the existence of life in carbonaceous meteorites. And he kind of drew back and said, well, yes, I guess I see how you might interpret it that way. <laughs> it was out of his own book. <laughs> uh, this is uh, a piece of the Orgueil meteorite. This is in Montauban, that piece is about that big around, uh, Argueil is very precious. That's worth an enormous amount of money. Uh, but of course, nobody sells Argueil anymore because nobody has any to sell. It's all in museums or being used for scientific research. Here in the Argueil meteorite, we see a, an absolute mat of cyanobacteria, lots of fill. And now notice, this is a 20 micron bar. We're not talking about nanometer sized things. We're talking about giant microorganisms. This guy here is 60, 70 uh, microns. Here's one that's about 40 microns across. Uh, this is Microcoleus. Uh, th this is a coiling cyanobacteria, uh, and we're finding a very interesting array of these uh, coiling cyanobacteria now in the carbonaceous meteorites. Um, this, this is an interesting, uh, which I, I don't know whether this is biological or abiotic. Uh, that's one of the amazing framboids that we find in, uh, in the Orgueil meteorite, Tagish Lake, and many of these others. The filaments in the Orgueil meteorite are often carbon rich, and the sheaths are infilled with magnesium sulfate minerals. Uh, many of the filaments have size and morphology very uh, much identical to well-known cyanobacteria and sulfur bacteria. And we find a diverse array of modes of reproduction in, uh, in these uh, particular kinds of cyanobacteria. We find septate binary fission and cleavage. Uh, we find multiple fission and formation of bio biocytes, uh, trichomic fragmentation, which is a formation of hormogonia, and resting cells uh, and germination, uh, formation of spores and aconites. Here is a very nice picture of a, of a uh, filament uh, from Orgueil, and this beautifully shows the size and shape of individual cells on the inside of this very, very thick sheath, so we can see cell wall constrictions, and that makes it possible to determine that this is a unisariate linear chain of cells, 1.8 microns in diameter by 5.5 microns in length. This is uh, very rare. I've only found uh, these two structures in, in the uh, meteorites that I've been studying. Uh, but the, here you see cell reproduction by, uh, by the uh, multiple fission, the formation of biocytes. Uh, there also are terminal hell, hairs. Uh, that is entirely consistent with the cyanobacteria belonging to the order Pleurocapsales. Uh, this is Lingbia. Uh, we have uh, uh, Lingbia here, uh, Lingbia wallii, and, and here we see an emergent hormogonium. The way this cyanobacteria reproduces is a, a cell becomes a necrophyte, it dies, and a short chain forms in cells at the two ends, and then it comes out into the aqueous environment and then starts growing by simple mitotic division and forms another big uh, long chain of cells, uh, another filament. Um, each of these individual cells is like a stack of coins, of uh, 10 euro coins. And so it's like you put them in a, in a holder, which is this sheath. Now this one is empty because the cells have all uh, evaded or, or evacuated from this sheath. And after the cells leave, these sometimes collapse upon themselves. This is a collapsed filament in my laboratory of living oscillatory loot. But the important point here 
is in the center. This is not from living structures. This is from the Orgelia meteorite. And you see a thick uh, sheath with an emergent hormogonium here. And you see here a collapsed filament, just like we see here and we see here. We have here evidence of oscillatory ACN motility in cyanobacteria that died long ago on the parent body of the uh, Orge meteorite. And when these cyanobacteria move, the oscillatory ACI move in a spiraling kind of motion. And as they oscillate and spiral along, sometimes the sticky substance, the exopolysaccharide on the sheath, will get stuck to a rock. And as they move, it gets twisted. And you see this nice little spiral down here. And then you can see that this whole filament has gotten twisted a bit. And then the, the trichome is emerging there. Very similar to what we call Lingbia spiralis. Uh, this is in uh, deep Vostok ice, a nice spiral sheath where the, uh, the filament has, uh, has left it. And we see the same kind of a spiral sheath here in a long filament in the Orgaia meteorite. Now again, this is a 20 micron bar, so you can get an idea how absolutely huge uh, these, these uh, microfossils are. Nitrogen has to be fixed in order for it to be utilizable by biological materials. And to break this uh, uh, very strong triple bond, uh, the nitrogenase enzyme is used. And the problem is the nitrogenase enzyme is poisoned by oxygen, and the cyanobacteria is carrying out photosynthesis and producing oxygen. So nature has a problem. How do you deal with that conundrum? Well. It came up with a beautiful way. This is living uh, Calithrix, uh, a very small species, as yet probably unnamed, but from the Little White River of Oregon. And here you see this thick-walled heterocyst, which contains the uh, nitro nitrogenase uh, enzyme on the inside. We call that a heterocyst. The filament goes up, and it tapers to an apical uh, terminal end and an apical hair. Uh, here we see these smooth structures. Uh, uh, similar to the basal heterocysts of, uh, of Calithrix, and embedded filaments with uh, uh, hairs emerging at the end here. This is all in the Orge meteorite. And here's from uh, uh, the Schirmacher Aesis in uh, Antarctica. I collected living Calithrix. Here you see the uh, basal heterocyst here, and it comes up and gets tapering as it goes to the end. And there's a close-up of that heterocyst from the image in Orgade that I showed previously. And you can see that you've got nodules on the filament, which has ridges and nodules and bumps, but the, the apical heterocyst is a very thick-walled, very smooth structure. This is a terminal heterocyst on a uh, uh, cyanobacteria that if we found it in earth or, or ponds or rivers, we would call it cylindrospermum. But it's not uh, uh, certain that's exactly what it is uh, because it's in the meteorite. And here we find Nosticacean filaments in the meteorite with uh, an internal uh, heterocyst here. Uh, this is a blow up of this large filament. And you see up at the top here is a heterocyst, and down here is the one that we're looking at there. This is a beautiful array of, of very, very interesting uh, filaments in Orge. Uh, and this structure here is, this is either an aconite or a heterocyst. Can't tell for sure. But this structure is most interesting, because when I took a very close image of it, it is very clear that this is an acrotarch belonging to the genus Leosphoridia. Uh, Leosphoridia is also an extinct organism. And in addition to that, you see it is literally surrounded by a whole array of, of different filaments. So well preserved, you can see cross wall constrictions. And if you had the right angle, you could determine what was the size and shape of the cell. Uh, again, filaments uh, in, embedded in the rock of Orge. Uh, this is 2D X-ray map of that region, and you see the high sulfur in these filaments. You see the high magnesium. So there are filaments in filled with magnesium sulfate. Again, uh, one of those filaments showing a high carbon content. 
These are very, very intricate structures uh, uh, called Lophotrichus tufts of fimbriae uh, in a cyanobacteria in the, uh, the Orgay meteorite. Uh, this is a 200 nanometer bar in an image taken at 80,000 X. When Dr. Rosemary Ripka, who is the world authority on cyanobacteria, saw these, she said, we never see fimbriae like that because they always stick down in the sticky exopolysaccharide and they only image them with transmission electron microscopy. Here they are standing up in free space. And I think the only way that can be explained is that the water that was around them evaporated very rapidly. And you don't get rapid evaporation on Earth, but you could get rapid evaporation on a comet if a pool near the surface was exposed to vacuum because of a chunk of the surface blowing away. And so you could get rapid and immediate freeze drying and preservation of these structures. The preservation of fossils in the carbonaceous meteorites is unlike anything we ever see in terrestrial rocks. It is far, far better. In fact, it's hard to see that in living things. Uh, this is a beautiful, large uh, epsomite and fill cyanobacterial filament. And, and here we, we've taken the spectrum there, and you see the huge amount of carbon uh, and, and small amount of oxygen. And then when we take the spectrum here, we look through that sheath and we get into the interior, so we're seeing a lot more of the magnesium sulfur, uh, magnesium sulfate, magnesium sulfur and oxygen that is infilling the filament. We found a very interesting organism called Obruchavella. That's a coiling cyanobacteria. This is in an image that I did several years ago before I even had heard of this type of organism. I just learned about it last summer when I was doing research in Dubna at the Astrobiology Institute there. And it turns out that these Obruchavella are beautiful coiling microorganisms. Uh, and here's, uh, here's one in the Orgay meteorite. These are from the Alk Shale of India. Uh, that's about uh, 500 million years old. Uh, this organism actually became extinct on Earth about 400 million years ago. Uh, and yet we find very beautiful, well-preserved remains of loose coils and tight coils in the Orgay meteorite. Diatoms are very interesting to me. I've been intrigued with diatoms for many, many years. Uh, uh, this is a picture of diatoms from Jeremy Haiti that I published in an article in June 1979 called Those Marvelous Myriad Diatoms in National Geographic. The taxonomy is based entirely on the shell morphology. They're one of the largest and most ecologically significant organisms on Earth. Uh, easy to recognize because of their unique shell structure and silicified cell wall and life cycle. And they're found all over the planet Earth. They account for about 20% of the global fixation of carbon, which is more than all of the world's tropical rainforests. In, 19, or in 2012, a big fireball was seen over Polonaru in north central Sri Lanka. I went there and was there exactly a month after the fireball was reported. Dikiri Banda here in his rice paddy field with my GPS, he burned his hand when he picked up one of these stones. He didn't pick this one up because I found it. <laughs> and it was just lying there. These are rice grains, uh, rice leaves. Uh, and as soon as I saw it, I took aluminum foil and touched it on both sides and lifted it up and then immediately dropped it because these feel like foam rubber. They're like styrofoam. The density is 0.6. They will float on water. These stones are unlike, well, there are only two kinds of stones on Earth that'll float on water. There is uh, the pumice that comes out of volcanoes, and then there is also diatomite. But they are neither pumice nor diatomite. They're, as I said, density 0.6, but they contain isotropic plagioclase uh, 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 like hosts of silica uh, with shock fractured inclusions of ilmenite, phaolitic olivine, quartz, and zircons. The bulk mineral is accessory clistobolite, uh, hersonite, and northite, as we saw previously uh, in, from a comet. Uh, and, it, and they contain high pressure polymorphs of olivine, uh, including uh, Wadsleyite. And Wadsleyite forms at a pressure of about 20, uh, 20 gigapascals, which is formed in the mantle of the Earth at 425 kilometer depth. You don't expect Earth mantle rocks from 425 kilometers down lying on the surface of the soil of a rice paddy field. 
unless they fell there and those high pressure minerals were produced by a collision in space. We, we had studies of the triple oxygen isotopes done by Professor Andreas Pack and uh, Professor uh, Eizo Nakamura in two totally different facilities, and they both got essentially the same value for the, uh, the uh, Del-O17 and uh, Del-70O uh, Del and the Delta-70O, and here we have values of, of about 0.335 and that puts the Polonorora stones down here uh, in the range of the CV carbonaceous chondrites. Orgay is way up here. This line here is what's called the terrestrial fractionation line, and all of the rocks of the Earth and the Moon lie on that line. We find beautiful acrotarchs in Polonorora. These are spectacular acrotarchs. This is lying on the edge of a, of a crater. Uh, very, very well preserved, uh, similar to Laosferidia. Uh, the reason I'm interested in talking to palynologists is we find things like this, an extinct hystricosphere, at least I think it may be a hystricosphere, I'm not certain of that. Here's the, the carbon map and you see a huge amount of carbon. But look at these gigantic spines. Now this is a 100 micron bar. So this is an enormous microorganism with spines that are going out 150, 200 microns long, very, very thin, and they're not broken. Now, you would never expect to find a fossil like that in a modern or an ancient terrestrial rock, any kind of terrestrial rock. Embedded in the uh, Polonura meteorite, we have beautiful uh, diatoms like this. That's a colonial chain diatom, which I can identify as being Alicocera ambigua. And the reason I can identify it is we look at the enlarged images from the meteorite diatom and we see these slits. Uh, those uh, slits are Remoportulae. Uh, it also exhibits uh, Ringulus and uh, other structures that are completely consistent with the polar marine diatom Alicocera ambigua. Lives in polar oceans, Shouldn't expect to find it on top of a mountain 10 degrees away from the equator. Also, it's a saltwater diatom, and, and they don't like putting salt water on their rice paddy fields because that has a tendency to keep them from growing rice for quite a long time. These are beautiful frustules of Hanchia amphioxus and the Araphid pinnate diatom uh, at Ardisonia robusta in uh, Polonarua. This thing is not built like a diatom should be built. Uh, it's built like a sword in a sheath instead of a petri dish. And uh, I've never seen a diatom like that in my entire life. I, I have no idea for a fact that it is a diatom, but it's a silica shell. It looks like a diatom, except it got built the wrong way. So uh, I have no idea what that is. Now, one of the problems with polar rua is a lot of people say, well, we don't really know for sure that it's a meteorite, although I am convinced it's a meteorite. But the meteoritists don't like it because it contains such spectacular biology. And so we come now to a problem for them. Everybody knows Orgay is a meteorite. When I first started studying meteorites, I expected to find diatoms everywhere because I'd done a paper with the late Sir Fred Hoyle in which we argued that uh, diatoms were, uh, or silica type diatoms were similar to diatoms were responsible for a major component of the interstellar dust. And I thought we would find diatoms throughout the meteorites and did not. Uh, in fact, the first good diatom in Orgay or Murchison I found last summer, and here's a diatom that had just reproduced right before it died, and it's broken here. Uh, this, this diatom is, uh, uh, has the same characteristics as Penularia sigariana, which was found by Fogad and described in 1979 from New Zealand. Well, not from the south of France. And in fact, Penularia sigariana has not been described previously from any other location other than New Zealand. And here it is in Orgoy. Uh, this is like Navicula Shmasmani, but I can't tell much details about it because it's so overcoated with magnesium sulfate. In conclusion, water, energy, and biogenic elements coexist throughout the solar system and the universe. Biomolecules with an L excess of protein amino acids in carbonaceous meteorites suggest life. The presence of chlorophyll breakdown products like porphyrins, pristane, and phytane indicate ancient life. And the absence of 12 protein amino acids and two nucleobases and a host of other life critical biomolecules proves that the meteorites are not contaminated by modern microorganisms, bacteria, cyanobacteria, or diatoms. 
SEM studies in the United States and Russia have shown that all uh, CI1 and CM2 carbonaceous meteorites we've examined contain abundant and astonishingly well-preserved fossils of prokaryotic and eukaryotic organisms. Energy dispersion spectroscopy indicates that they are nitrogen poor and uh, uh, therefore are not uh, modern contaminants that invaded the meteorites after they landed. Anomalous oxygen carbon ratios and the presence of extinct uh, microorganisms indicates that these are actually the ancient indigenous remains of extraterrestrial life forms that grew on the parent body of the meteorite long before it entered the Earth's atmosphere and died there. Uh, I want to acknowledge discussions with a number of very eminent uh, scientists, uh, Academician Rosanoff, Academician Galimov, and the late Academician Georgi Zavarzin, who wrote the microbiology textbooks that were studied by almost all microbiologists in Russia. Uh, Ludmila Gerasimenko there, uh, who also died a few years ago, but she was one of their premier experts on cyanobacteria, and Rosemary Ripka Herdman of Institute Pasteur, scanning electron microscopy with Greg German at uh, NASA and uh, uh, Jane Wallace, uh, Norimiyaki, and Max Wallace at Cardiff and uh, at the Paleontological Institute with Elena Gala and the samples I've mentioned before where the samples uh, came from. So I conclude with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, and we have time for one or two quick questions. So, would anyone like to start? Surely someone has a question. Everyone seems to be quite overwhelmed. Oh, okay. Please speak loudly, I have trouble. Oh, yes. Can you see, if we see such forms of bacteria uh, in me meteorites, uh, with, uh, uh, which uh, level of pro probability we uh, can uh, speak about uh, extraterrestrial life on these uh, objects? And, and what we uh, can see uh, in, in order to make a statement uh, with uh, uh, Oh, 100 probabilities uh, that uh, life uh, exists in this. Well, I'm an observational scientist. My, my approach is uh, if I look at meteorites and if there are no microfossils there, and I've looked at many that didn't have microfossils, then I don't find them. If I look at meteorites and I find microfossils and I find biological structures that I can identify as being biological based on knowledge of other terrestrial organisms, then I conclude that what I'm looking at is biology. Uh, so I don't know how one would approach this with a probabilistic uh, study. It's uh, like if you go to the zoo and see an elephant and someone asks you what's the probability there's an elephant there. Okay, and one more question. Many examples of seeing uh, fossils uh, or remnants of uh, uh, microorganisms in the uh, extraterrestrial rocks. Uh, uh, so, what are the challenges of, the, of your science now? What is the chances of what? Uh, challenges. 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 What are, ah. you thinking, what are you after? <laughs> the challenges. Uh, well, the, the question is very simple. Either microfossils exist in meteorites or they don't. And uh, the challenge that I give to the challengers is twofold. One, there are many scientists that have studied the biomolecules. And if these are recent contaminants, then they must explain to me how you can contaminate a stone with living organisms and not put in all of the requisite biomolecules of life. It is not a possibility. Unless you did it millions of years ago and allowed those biomolecules to disintegrate, uh, but uh, that's a difficulty because since human beings weren't around to do this experiment millions of years ago, that gets into another area. The other point that I make is 
if you science has to be repeatable science has to be something that others can do to reproduce the same information and what I'm I'm saying is that if anyone questions this get a piece of Murchison or a piece of Orgay and put it under an electron microscope and if you don't know cyanobacteria or microbiology bring a microbiologist to sit alongside of you and ask you don't even have to tell them what they're looking at just ask them if they see anything that looks interesting uh, of course uh, the problem is you have to be able to recognize cyanobacteria if you look at a meteorite because if you don't know what cyanobacteria looks like you could look at a sample and not understand what you're seeing but basically meteoriticists as a general rule don't look at meteorites with electron microscopes there are very few of us that do and I'm hoping that maybe some of you will get interested in doing this kind of work astrobiology is wonderful it's multidisciplinary you can study extremophile microorganisms you can study the origin of life you can study a wide variety of areas and uh, and I think it's really going to be profoundly important because at some point in hopefully not too different distant future will actually go to places like Enceladus and Europa and Mars and bring back samples and I believe when we do we will find biology and I believe the biology that will be find will be very very similar to the biology and obey the laws of biomolecules and molecular biology and biochemistry that governs every living organism on the planet earth okay I think we are just out of time, but there will be a discussion with Professor Hoover starting at 6 o'clock this evening. So I encourage all of you to come there and uh, pose your questions then. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>